Okay, I'm going to go ahead and begin. So we're going to talk about something called JES, Job Entry Subsystem. After we complete this section, you're going to understand the relationship between JCL and JES. You should be able to describe the JES spool. You should be able to list three JES Q types, describe an initiator, and describe the relationship between SDSF and JES. So we talked about JCL, the job statements, execute statement, the DD statements. And we, inside the operating system, we've got these things called internal readers. And an internal reader can actually read JCL statements. Prior to internal readers, there used to be Hollerith punch cards. And people used to have card decks and read them in. But with internal readers, now that can just be a group of statements in a data set that gets submitted or started. Well, we have a job management facility called JES2, and there is a JES3 also, but we're going to focus on JES2. I will let you know that JES3 was very important before IBM came up with the concept and the, the technology of a parallel sysplex. Because before we had parallel sysplex, you could have a JES3 complex where the JESs on different operating systems could talk to each other. But JES2 is probably the most commonly used JES. It's a little bit easier to take care of. And so that's what we're going to be focusing on is JES2. JES2 and JES3 do have a lot in common. It's just JES3 has a few more features to it. So all, a lot of different input devices can put things into what's called the JES input queue. So JES itself is a subset of ZOS. It's a subsystem of ZOS. And JES has an input queue. It's got an execution queue, and it's got an output queue. What are the three queue types? Input, execution, output. But you can actually get things into the input queue from many different sources. As you saw, FTP was even one of them. Um, there's lots of ways to get things into the JES input queue to be executed, and then the output gets collected by JES. Once the output's in the output queue, it can go to a physical printer, or it can be placed on some other uh, medium. You saw this picture before. So many times a user will determine the job to be run. You'll create some JCL, but as I mentioned, many times people don't create JCL from scratch. They take a template from somewhere, modify it. They submit the job. The job is JCL. JES interprets the JCL and passes it to the operating system. The operating system does the work. JES collects the output. And then the user can view the output and interpret the output. JES has something called a spool. The spool is actually a special type of data set formatted by JES, and JES knows how to deal with it. To you, it just looks like a sequential data set, but if you try to view it, it doesn't make any sense. But it's a special disk data set called a spool. The spool formatted disk is what holds the input queue, the output queue, and execution queue information. So JES uses one or more disk data sets for the spool data set. We call it spooling for getting input and doing the output. Uh, I think there's a question. So Sujin asked, just curious to know about how open system SanDisk is different from mainframe storage SanDisk. Um, it's a, it's a, it's actually a very interesting question. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to answer that. There's two types of disk called CKD. Uh, key count data, 
And then there's FBA, fixed blocked architecture. And um, there's fiber channel switch disk. And it turns out that the mainframe can actually deal with both. And um, the SAN disk, uh, the SAN controller, um, an example is the mainframe really doesn't deal with the SAN volume controller. And this gets to be a whole nother discussion. And as I'm thinking about it, Sujin, we may want to take this one offline and because it gets into another whole discipline of things. There are some differences, um, but the mainframe is very flexible in what it can do. I'll just put it that way. So I'm going to answer that one kind of short. Okay, so what does an initiator do? Well, once you're in the input queue, there's got to be an initiator available to process the job. The initiator, I always think of it as the point of presence between JEZ and the ZOS operating system itself. The initiator is where the work is done. So it can be an input queue waiting for an available initiator. Once an initiator becomes available, if the job has the right attributes that match the initiator attributes, it will jump on the initiator and begin the process. So the initiator permits us to run multiple jobs asynchronously. Uh, we ensure jobs do not conflict in data usage. So how do we do that with data usage? Well, if you say disk equal old in the JCL, then that means I want exclusive use of a data set. And if I get exclusive use of a data set, when I've got it and while I'm processing, no one else can get to it. So it also can ensure that single user devices, it's like tape drives, are allocated correctly. Also, the initiator, they find the executable program requested by the job, and it cleans up at job end. And as it put, as, we, as the arrow uh, is indicating, prevents two users from accessing the same data set at the same time. That's the disk equal old, disposition equal old. So this diagram here actually shows the spool, and you'll actually see that here's one concept. Remember I mentioned on the DD statement there's a DD asterisk, and then there can be some in-stream data? Well, that actually can be stored on the spool because it becomes part of the input stream. And they're actually showing the program can read that because, remember, we have the DD asterisk, so there's more than just there, – there's data that can be stored in there if it's in stream, but that's kind of rare. Um, and then the program can read it. And the program showing here, it's writing to the SysApp. And then Jez can actually put it on a printer. But the whole idea of the spool is for storing the input, even things like the DD asterisk where data follows, that can be stored on the spool to be read by the program. So JEZ actually goes through some different flow. And the flow includes uh, input, conversion, processing, output, print, and purge. I'm not going to – we've got a couple diagrams, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. So JCL enters the system. JEZ then – it goes to the input. JEZ goes through a conversion. So it goes through a conversion queue. Oh, by the way, when it inputs, notice we put it on the spool. That's the end of the input queue. It goes through a conversion queue, then the processing queue. Then as it um, is completing its processing, those things go to the output queue. And then there's a hard copy processing in case it goes to a printer. And if it goes to a printer, once it's out there, it purges it from the spool. If it doesn't go to a printer, it can be placed in the spool indefinitely or until somebody purges it or an automated command purges it. Oh, and so this was meant to be a um, – in the PowerPoints, it actually shows it moving, but this is the whole process here. 
So what you can do on a job card, you can actually on a job card give it a class. These classes are determined by JES parameters. So the system programmer can say, oh, I've got class A, class B, class C, can have different classes. And each one of the classes can have different characteristics and attributes and rules assigned to the classes. Now, I'm going to come back to the parameters, but what I want to tell you now is that JES itself is JCL. So this is, a, this is actually looking at a JES 2 procedure, and it executes this program, HAS JES 20, and it actually points to PROC libraries where there are more JCL PROCs. So you can execute PROC equal, and if it's not in stream, it will search through this DD concatenation. How do I know it's concatenation? PROC 00, PROC lib, no DD name. So it searches through all these to find a PROC that you may execute. So instead of executing a program, you would execute a PROC, and this is the system. This would represent the system search order. Now, JES also has a whole bunch of parameters. So when this program executes, it's looking for something called JES, JES uh, actually, I'm sorry, HASP PARM. And it's looking for a DD name called HASP PARM. And inside of here is the initialization and tuning parameters for JES that actually control the global behavior of JES. So you could put those parameters anywhere, you just got to tell the proc. Now, you might be thinking about this time. Well, wait a minute. He just made a statement and said, JES is JCL. So you start JES, and it finds that JCL and reads it. Well, wait a minute. I thought he said that JES reads JCL. So if JES is not available, who read this JCL? There's something called the master scheduler. Before JES existed, the master scheduler can read JCL. So the, the JES is considered a subsystem because you can say start JES2 and comma sub for subsystem equal MSTR. And what that does is say, Master Scheduler, I need you to read this. So prior to JES being available, there was a Master Scheduler that could read JCL. The problem is the Master Scheduler doesn't have the, the spool for managing input, output, and we needed that for managing inputs and outputs. So the Master Scheduler can also read JCL, and I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about overview of the operating system. But to start JES, JES is really JCL itself, and it has a series of parameters that shape the global behavior of the environment, of the JES environment, and many of those can be dynamically changed. So here's an example of some of the things inside of the JES parameters. And you can say, oh, I want, in this case, I want 99 initiators. Each initiator's got a number but each initiator can be assigned a class. Like in this case, initiator number one, and we named it one, it can have class KAB74. And what are those classes? Well, here's an example of a job class statement inside of JES, and you can do things like limit the time, or you can say, I'm going to permit bypass label processing, or it will accept slash, slash, command cards. And so there's different things you can do in the class statement to say that class is allowed to do this or not allowed to do this. Different, different initiators can be assigned different classes. Now here's an example. I'm an SDSF, and what I did, I went to the SDSF primary option menu, and I typed in init, and this gave me an initiator list. And here's my initiator IDs. 
Here's the classes assigned to the initiators. So in your job card, you can say class equal, and it would find an initiator with that class. But notice these statuses. If an initiator class is active, that means that there's something processing on that initiator right now. So for example, in this case, here's a, a job, and this is the job name that's actually processing. It's executing. An inactive status means I'm just waiting for work. If something uh, is one of those classes, you can put it on me and I'm waiting for work. If the initiator is drained, that means it's been stopped. The initiator is there, but no one can occupy it because it's drained. That was a whirlwind about Jez, and I'm not going to go into great detail about Jez, but I will tell you that one of the, here's the three, four, excuse me, the four best books to read, professional manuals, about Jez 2. There is a Jez 2 bookshelf. So you would go to that bookshelf that we talked about earlier, and you would find ZOS Jez 2. Four of the best books in there, look at the introduction, look at the commands book, and look at the initialization and tuning guide, look at the initialization and tuning reference. Reference is typically organized by syntax, guide is usually organized by concept. So now you can actually understand the relationship between JCL and JES, because JCL is read by JES, describe the JES spool, List three queue types, input queue, output queue, execution queue. Describe the initiator. Well, that's where the execution really gets done. And describe the relationship between SDSF and JES. You can use SDSF for looking at the input queue, the output queue, the execution queue. You can actually look at the initiators. Um, there's a lot of things you can do with SDSF as a, as a visibility into the JES world. Okay, so that, this is a very short session, and that's the end of this session.